Welcome back to AV Veterans Talk. We're continuing our conversation with this week's guest, Bob Abrams. So, Bob, uh, you got on the Big Bird and flew to, to Vietnam, uh, as they say, and uh, you landed in country over there. And uh, well, you were in Dominican Republic there, but, I mean, culture shock when you step in there? Obviously, you're in a military world, but, I mean, suddenly you were, in, you were on the other side of the the planet across the Pacific, at least, and different culture, different mindsets. Even getting there. Yeah. When we deployed to the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. we flew in C-130 cargo ships mm -hmm. and landed. And when we got on the trucks to take us to Sanasta to take us to our post, there was a line with sandbags and they told us if anybody starts shooting at us, lay down because we hadn't been given weapons yet. Yeah. So flying to Vietnam, I figured someone's going to issue me a rifle before I get on the airplane. Right. It was a commercial airplane. Okay. Not a military airplane. So mm -hmm. I mean, well, that's yeah. odd. And we flew over Alaska, landed at Tokyo, and then, then made it into Cameron Bay. And we got there at night, and <laughs> he landed at Cameron Bay. I'm expecting combat conditions. And he got lights on. And City. Tribal. Yeah. We're on Cameron Bay. is a huge base. Yeah. In fact, that was the most secure place in Vietnam at that time. Mm -hmm. And there was a... Being a major city, the lights were not a problem. I right. mean, you can have all the lights on you want to. Right. So uh, that was that's the cultural shock that I had. I thought I was going to have to fight my way off the airplane. Yeah. No, just, <laughs> weaponless. Weaponless, yeah. And you don't get a weapon until you get to where you're being deployed. Right, right. And uh, when I first got in country, they had a heck of a fight going up on uh, it's Docto, up in that area. It's mm. in the mountainous area, and a couple mm. of hills were under contention and they were i don't know if they were trying to defend them or take them back anyway they were running out of sergeants for well, some reason okay and a lot of guys who had come were cooks or whatever were being redeployed as platoon or squad sergeants up to up there when you're in the army you're infantrymen first absolutely before anything job else. one fortunately for my sake and i say fortunately because i didn't have to go to doc toe was that they were short of military police sergeants also so i went to a place called futai which is outside of quinyon Mm -hmm. Quinyan is a, on the ocean, some sea coast, about mid-country in the Central Highlands, and it uh, was an in-country R&R center. So when I got there, all like 66 MP company, all they did was they guarded the POW compound, did time patrol to make sure the guys didn't get in trouble who on R&R, &R, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I was probably in, probably in country about a week and uh, they decided that our company was going to redeploy as the Highway Patrol and Convoy Escorts for that area and move the 504th MPs out. Mm -hmm. So I was training with, with them, with the 504th, and uh, probably had my first firefight two days after I started working with those guys. Mm -hmm. So that was in October, November of 1967, mm -hmm. not knowing that Tet was coming in January, February of 1968. Right. And uh, suddenly those guys who had never fired their weapons in anger, it, who had been in the 66 MP company, yeah. we took over convoy escort and highway patrol, things changed. Yeah, So fast. Uh, explain a little bit of, of the Tet Offensive that came up and stuff. The well, they had 70,000 North Vietnamese troopers and uh, Viet Cong come south and occupy every major town in South Vietnam, including mm -hmm. Quinh Nhan. Mm-hmm. Uh, their idea was to clean the, each village of teachers and politicians and any leaders, I mean clean, kill them, and their families, and, and, and the, the Viet Cong had a way of doing it. Their kids, their animals, wipe out anything that appeared to, that nobody would remember who these people were. Right. In the most brutal way possible. Right. So they came down, and all those towns they took over, that's what their function was, was to just kill, kill, kill. The NVA, North Vietnamese Army, however, was they were coming down in mass, including tanks, and they meant to invade. Yeah. And they got as far as the DM, the, the military zone, DMV, DMZ. DMZ. And uh, the Green Berets and their troops, Vietnamese troops, stopped them, mm -hmm. blew up all their tanks. Mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> Plus, we have total air superiority over there. Yeah, absolutely. They never had a chance in yeah. tanks anyway. So. Yeah. But... Uh, Kind of stayed centralized up there. Most of the ones we faced were Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a week, maybe 10 days, we killed 25,000 of the, the Viet Cong. They, they ceased to become a force mm -hmm. in South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Wiped them out. 
in the NVA, I, I don't know how many, they lost tens of thousands, so the North Vietnamese troops also. As so we get Quezon came in and Way, yeah, and uh, I, did, I wasn't there, thank God. I, yeah. I stayed where I was <laughs> right. in Quinyan, so. Yeah. But it was a stinking mess, and we we did well. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I gave a talk at, at the memorial thing about how we did very well and thought we had won the war because there was nobody left to fire on. There was nobody. There was no enemy left. Right. We had a whole month there. We never even had never even fired a weapon. No firefights. No anything because they were all dead. Yeah. And we thought we may actually have a chance of winning this thing. Right. Let's rearm, re give us more ammunition. Let's all head north. Right. Let's finish this thing like they did in World War Two. Right. Right. And uh, we started getting. We had armed forces radio and television. And about a month and a half after that, we started getting. I'm watching the news. How there was a question mark about did we really win? Uh, what was the thinking that? Uh, they were told by our General Westmoreland that uh, this would never happen. And how did they get past our security? And how, how, how this, how that? And reporters just tore our guts out. Yeah. In other words, they were saying that we actually lost the war during the Tet Offensive. Yeah. Wow. In fact, uh, the general, I forget the general's name in charge of Vietnamese troops, he thought he was going to go back and get shot. <laughs> yeah. Because he did. lost so many people. Yeah heard the political atmosphere in America and the press talking the way they were talking and he and they they had won the political war correct yeah and having done that that, lo that war lasted a lot more than a lot longer than it should have oh absolutely so. and that's one thing you know we always kind of look back on uh, you know when uh, Gulf War one or desert storm you know once again uh, militarily speaking and stuff you need to uh, you know, finish the job, yes. you know, which Vietnam, uh, nobody was willing to finish the job. So we'll take a break. We'll come back here and uh, we'll continue this little journey on uh, uh, the Vietnam aspect of uh, your service here. So we'll be right back here with Bob. I'm Bob Alvis, and thanks for joining us for this segment of AV Veterans Talk. <laughs> 